Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in this workshop. And thank you to Abigail for setting the scene so wonderfully just before. Um, I think the aspect that I want to focus on in my presentation is focused around crystallographic data, so, uh, crystallographic data, but I'm also going to talk a bit about chemistry and in particular the role of data standards in enabling the fair publication of data from those domains. Um, by way of context, I am talking to you from the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Centre. Um, at the core of what the CCDC does is 3D structural data. Um, we curate and collect that data together. Um, but we also develop software that enables researchers in industry and academia to take advantage, not just of the data, but the knowledge embedded in that to apply it to real world scientific problems. Um, these tools also support research and education. At the very core of what we do at CCDC is the Cambridge Structural Database. And this has over 1 million small molecule, organic and metal organic crystal structures determined by researchers worldwide. Now, typically this data is being published alongside journal articles, but increasingly there are data sets that are being published independently in the CSD. We also try to get data from other places such as patents, theses and institutional repositories as well. An important facet of this, which I don't really talk about much going forward, is, is that, that we have a team of expert structural chemists who review the structures that come get deposited with us to make sure that they are fit for reuse. Um, and, and that, that's an important part of enabling that downstream use, but I'm going to talk about what we do to enable researchers um, up front to sort of like get their data into a, a state with the, it's fair when they actually deposit it. Now I've shown here a picture of the millionth CSD structure and it happens to be related to catalysis. It's an N heterocycle produced by a chalcogen bonding catalyst. And if we look in the CSD, we find other examples of catalysts. In the center is the very catalyst that, that, that generated that one millionth structure. Um, to the left is a H bonding thiourea organocatalyst. And then I've shown something that involves a combination of a polyoxometallate and a MOF, um, and, uh, which has a role in catalysis. And I'm grateful here to my colleague, Claire Tovey, who last year published a blog post um, that looked at sort of catalysts in the CSD with reference to various Nobel Prize winners. Now, this is just a snapshot of some of the charts and, and structures from her blog post. Um, we've got the metallocenes and we can sort of see how interesting these sort of like has grown over time. Um, and although it might have dwindled a little bit, still lots of them being produced today. Um, examples of triarchophosphine complexes that you find in the CSD. Um, grubs and then heterocyclic carbenes. Um, yeah, kind of popular and some palladium complexes as well. But the key thesis of um, Claire's blog post here wasn't just that there are lots of examples of these, but that if you've got lots of examples of these, you can use the data and the knowledge embedded in them to inform research and maybe generate new insights. And these are just three examples of a you know, kind of vast range of literature where people have used the collection of data in the CSD to do work in the area of catalysis, whether it be combining um, the data in the CSD with other experimental techniques to um, design new catalysts, whether it be probing particular um, bonding that you might find in a particular class of catalysts or developing systems that can automate the design of these sorts of things. And this, I think, is all very much good illustration of the original vision that was behind the formation of the Cambridge Structural Database, which was articulated by its founding executive director, Olga Kennard, as a passionate belief that collective use of data can lead to the discovery of new knowledge and insights that transcend the results of those individual experiments. Now, a lot has happened since the CSD was formed. Um, uh, back in 1965, um, a time when your pictures were likely to be black and white and static. And when it came to sort of creating database entries, it was a case of transcribing coordinates um, out of articles. And if we fast forward sort of half a century or so, we get to a world where the fair data principles very much dominate discussions around research data management. And I don't need to go into details of this because Abigail has very kind of adeptly kind of like um, she explained sort of like the basis of the fair data principles. But just as she had her slide as well with the sort of key concepts that fair embodies down on the kind of right hand side of my slide here are some of the key elements that I think are important enablers of making fair a reality. 
But the ones I want to focus on in the rest of this sort of presentation are around data and metadata standards, persistent identifiers, which um, Abigail uh, mentioned, but also the importance of having workflows that pull these together and support the deposition and publication of these data sets and the role that domain data repositories can, um, uh, uh, can have. But let's start by thinking about a crystallography experiment. And a lot of this could apply to any kind of analytical experiment that you might undertake in a chemical context. You're likely to have a sample. Um, there'll be information about how that was um, synthesized, crystallized maybe. It will have physical and chemical properties. It will have a chemical identity. Um, you'll have an instrument such as a diffractometer on which you're gonna undertake your experiment. That will have uh, make and a model. Um, there'll be various parameters um, about how that's been set up um, and the conditions in which it's operating. Of course, data is key. Um, that's going to come out of your experiment. There may be different types of data, the raw data, the process data, the derived data that's the result that you're primarily interested in. Um, you might have various quality metrics associated that, with that data that tell you kind of like uh, tell you things about the sort of experimental nature of that. Software plays an increasing role in, in how we um, analyze and generate data. So you need to understand the versions of the software packages used, parameters you might have specified. And then of course, there's the final publication. Um, if it's associated with an article, which article does it in a database? What's its ID? Lots of things to think about in terms of data and metadata. Now, crystallography is blessed with the foresight of Sid Hall in particular, who came up with a file format called um, the Crystallographic Information File, or CIF. Um, and this is able to capture pretty much all of those facets that I just talked about of an experiment. Um, the details of the sample, the equipment, the experimental conditions, information about the software. You can even embed your instruction files in a CIF these days as well. But the important thing is this is just not a format. Underpinning this, there is a sort of data dictionary that defines the specific data fields that are um, you're going to capture in that file. So to take a simple example, if you're putting a temperature in, it will say that that temperature is expected to be in Kelvin. So you don't got any confusion about units. Um, it will tell you about, you know, kind of how it's expected that you calculate and report your chemical formula weight. Now, these dictionaries are developed and maintained by the International Union of Crystallography. But I think Abigail made the point about shared responsibility. And I think the importance of um, the, the success of SIF within the crystallographic um, domain wouldn't have happened without the buy-in of the people producing the software packages to generate these files and data repositories and publishers who then require people to make their data available in that particular format. Now at the CCDC, we try to make it easy once people have this file um, format to sort of follow and sort of like comply with subsequent community recommendations about how to publish your data. Um, and this is captured in our deposition process. And what we're trying to achieve here is capturing reliable data and metadata and setting yourselves up to enable linking between article and data set down the line. Um, just going to show a few ass snapshots from that process. Um, one of the important things is to make sure that the syntax of the file is correct. Um, one of the strengths of SIF was seen to be that it was human readable as well as machine readable. That's also a weakness because that means humans can go in and edit it and sometimes that breaks the syntax. We can check for this, we can direct people how to fix it. But once we have a syntactically correct SIF, we could actually use community services and those of our own to um, have a look at the completeness, consistency, and integrity of the data, feedback at deposition time, and you know, maybe offer suggestions to the crystallographer about how that data might be improved or aspects might need to be explained before it goes on to be published. And then towards the end of the deposition process, we're looking at what's in the file, reporting that back to the user, encouraging them to provide additional physical properties that they might not have captured in the file in the first place. Um, we're also thinking about how we can link out to related data. So we don't aren't in a position to store raw data, but we can link out to places where that data might be stored. Now, Abigail talked about embargoes and the importance of access controls. So we have, once, once a data set's been deposited with us, um, you can go in, you can review your deposits. Um, if it hasn't yet been published, you can make edits. If you've um, been provided, if you've got updated information, you can share those files. Um, we enable sharing of that data with 
referees for the peer review process. Um, and then once it's published, it will be um, sort of set in stone as the sort of structure of record that, 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 that has been put out um, to the wider community. Now you can publish directly both through the CSD as you noted, but many structures are still today published alongside articles. And so we work closely with publishers to make sure that we have workflows in place that mean when an article's out there, there's a link back from that article to the data set at the CCDC. And absolutely key to this is exchanging information between repository and publisher, in particular PIDs. And so Again, Abigail sort of touched on these, but if we look at a record for a CSD entry, um, we can see that we've got our own accession ID, which remains important, not just for us, but in other resources sometimes. Um, we do also sign a data set DOI once the structure has been published, which um, enables um, more reliable citation. Um, but the infrastructure surrounding DOIs also enables greater interoperability with other systems. We capture ORCID IDs, which helps make sure that the provenance and the attribution of the data set is properly captured. And we make sure we provide a link back to the article ourselves. I think this is a lot to think about, but again, a role of a data repository here is trying to make sure that this is all taken care of, uh, taken all care of for the researcher so they don't need to worry. Now, there's one other type of identifier that I want to talk a little bit about here, and that is something called the INCHI, the IUPAC International Chemical Identifier. Now, if you haven't heard of INCHI, the idea behind this is that if you take equivalent but different representations of the same substance, you put it through the standard INCHI generator, you will get out a string that is the same for both of those equivalent representations. And this is important to aid with findability um, because it's a way that you can go and retrieve chemical structures of information about a particular compound from different resources using this standard INCHI key. But it's also important for the interoperability piece of FAIR, which is linking between different resources, whether they be data sets or resources on the web. And at the CCDC, again, we've been able to take advantage of INCHI to do just that. This is one of our most linked structures in the CCDC. Um, it links out to information in the biopesticides database. It tells you about how this substance might be used in food. Um, we can have a look at this substance in the context of a protein structure in the protein data bank. We can get various access to various properties associated with it in PubChem, and we can see its entry in drug bank, and we can see its vitamin C, which might be why it's so sort of like prolific across all these databases. Now, I'm not going to pretend INCHI is um, perfect. Um, I'm actually involved in the INCHI Trust, which is responsible for its sort of like sustainability and development. Um, and I'd love to say it's perfect, but there are areas where development is needed. And I think one of the big ones there is organometallics. Um, INCHI, when it comes to organics, does a pretty good job, 80 to 90%, if not more reliability, I would say. Um, when you come into the world of organometallics, you, how you represent the structure in a consistent and reliable machine readable way is a challenge. How the algorithms should then process that to come up with a sort of consistent string is a top topic of discussion, but one which I hope will have some sort of resolution on um, in the sort of year ahead or so. Now we've moved into the area of chemistry generally, and I just want to serve, share a few thoughts um, about um, kind of practices of research, well, the state of research data sharing in chemistry and some of the work that's going on to help enable more fair publication of um, chemistry data. Now, there is a view out there that chemists aren't very good at sharing data. And this is a chart from a study that was undertaken in 2015, which was looking at proportion of articles that mention having original and available data and that actually share that data. And chemistry doesn't come off very well. But if you look at another chart there, it has a look at the articles that refer to original data. And actually there are more articles in chemistry than any other domain looked at that are referring to original data. And I think it's wrong to say that chemists don't share data. I think they've been doing it for centuries, um, but it's primarily in supporting information either in a PDF or embedded in the article or as a static image. And this slide shows an excerpt from a poster that was produced by um, uh, researchers at the University of Michigan that looked at where you might find different types of 
data um, in a chemistry article and a lot of it in supplementary information, some of it referenced in the article. One of their key conclusions is that this is not being presented in a particularly reusable form. So chemists do share data, but it's falling short of those expectations of machine readability that Abigail was referring to earlier on. Now this chart here, uh, don't worry about the detail, worry more about the colours, was um, a survey done by Vince Galfani um, at the University of Alabama, and he looked at different chemistry journals, their journal, their policies regarding to data and different chemistry data types. And the bits shown in green are where the journal policies requiring a particular type of data to be required in the repository. And those specifically relate to crystallography and structural biology, as we might expect. Um, the ones in yellow are where there were sort of um, requirements to include this data in the manuscript and spectra sort of come came through here as something where perhaps publishers were expecting more than maybe in other areas. And this has sparked a range of activities, including workshops um, to think about, OK, what do we need to do to sort of like start moving publication of spectra data to an equivalent position that maybe we see in crystallography and maybe other disciplines where data sharing is more advanced. And it's been thinking about workflows. It's been thinking about the guidelines and the standards that you might need to be able to do this. And this workshop spawned a couple of outcomes. One is a fair spectra publishing pilot, which is being undertaken for a couple of ACS journals. Um, and they're just encouraging people to take their machine readable data and make it available alongside the article rather than just packing it up in a PDF or alongside the um, supplementary information. And then there's another project underway that's looking to define the sort of metadata standards that can wrap around the sort of machine readable data that you might have to sort of describe that those different levels, the metadata that Abigail was referring to in her presentation. There's other work going on um, to try and develop uh, standards um, uh, for chemistry data that will help enable the fairer publication of this. Um, Abraham mentioned Stuart Shork, who's going to talk after me and his involvement in the IUPAC Gold Book, which is basically a digital version of all the IUPAC terminologies that are out there. And the aim there is to provide something that will enable um, other systems to be able to link to those definitions, reuse them in a fair manner. There's projects going on looking at how we represent critically evaluated data. And I think these this sort of area becomes increasingly important. Um, one of the projects we've been pursuing in uh, collaboration with another institution around catalysis is wanting to apply machine learning to the data in the CSD to see what you can sort of predict. It's really, really hard because we don't have those sort of experimental conditions associated with the experiment readily available to be able to come up with the training models. So having the means by which to you know, describe properties and other facet aspects of a chemical substance in a sort of reliable and machine readable way is quite important. Um, there's work going on to sort of like come up with publication guidelines and then various symposia and workshops taking place involving a range of players within the chemistry community, but also outside of that. So my summary um, is that effective discovery and reuse of data requires community standards. And I would really point to sort of data and metadata standards and persistent identifiers as being really, really quite important for enabling that. Um, we have though, we have standards and workflows established for crystallography and they're being involved within the chemistry community. But I think something I'd say here is that, you know, if you've got some data and the standards aren't there or you're not sure, at least put it out there to the best of your ability. Um, FAIR is often said to be a journey and it's a journey for domains and subdomains and, you know, let's do what we can now and work together to sort of develop the sort of standards and other infrastructure that's needed to do better in the future. And data repositories can really help with this. Um, uh, and you know, if it's a domain repository, all the better, but your institutional repository might also be able to help um, guiding you and making it easy for you to comply with community standards and policies, supporting that sort of publication part, which can be quite complex, but ultimately providing a long-term home for your data that will enable future reuse. I'll end my presentation there. 
Um, it's just a brief sort of summary there of the sorts of things that you can do with the wider suite of CSD software, should that be um, relevant or of interest to your research. Acknowledge again, Claire, for her input into the examples here. Um, and if you do want to know information, do feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.